Have you ever wondered what it would be like to put your filmmaking skills to the test in a high risk or even dangerous location somewhere in the world? Like maybe you're interested in telling stories about conflict or social justice issues, or maybe your project just happens to be set in a place that's less than safe. Well, when I first got into the documentary industry, I was extremely drawn to this type of work. And it almost killed me when half my crew got shot in a narco ambush in Northern Mexico. And I'd like to think that a big reason why I survived is because over the years of working as a documentary photographer and filmmaker, I've learned a few things about the skills and training and tools that filmmakers need to know to stay safe in risky places. And that's exactly what I'm going to share in this video. Because if you're anything like me, a dangerous location isn't going to stop you from working there. But if you want to come back safely, you need to be prepared. So I've actually been shot at three times over the course of my career, one of which was intentional, and the other two times were just more cases of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. But each time I learned some important lessons, and I'm in no way trying to glorify these kinds of events because they all sucked big time. But when I started out in documentary photography, I was still young and naive enough to think that I was immortal. Not like physically immortal, obviously, but I thought somehow that because my intentions were good, that nothing bad would happen to me, no matter how crazy the situations I put myself into were. So I crawled into illegal gold mines. I hung out with drug addicts in multiple countries. I beelined it into the aftermath zones of natural disasters. And eventually I spent four years working with drug cartels in Latin America. But even though everything worked out and I'm here talking talking to you now, I learned the hard way that I was in no way protected from the violence of the world just because I was carrying a camera. And I want to make sure that if you decide to chase your dreams into the incredible world of documentary filmmaking, that you don't have to go through the same kind of trauma that I did. And just a heads up, there will be some graphic imagery in this video, so if you're dealing with something, I don't want to surprise you with something you don't want to see. Nothing too crazy here, but definitely a little more hardcore than what I normally share on this channel. Just heads up. Now, the first time I found myself in a live fire situation, I was working as a photojournalist and living in Cambodia. At the time, there was some major political turmoil in the country, and there were hundreds of thousands of people in the streets every day protesting the government and demanding open elections. As a young photographer at the time, just trying to break into the news industry, I went to as many of these protests as I could while trying to pitch photo stories to the big international papers. And it was a really exciting time when I felt like I was covering something important. I was so caught up in it, though, that I actually lost sight of how dangerous things really were, and I would do all sorts of really stupid stuff and just generally get way closer to the action than I should have. Actually, this is a great segue into the first tip I have when it comes to staying safe, because one of the times I realized I wasn't protected from the world around me was when I found myself caught between a brick-throwing mob and an increasingly angry line of riot police. Now, this actually was a pretty good spot to be photographically, but I had no situational awareness, and I didn't really understand that as the two sides closed in on each other, I was getting penned in with no easy way to escape. So when the cops broke ranks and charged the crowd to start clubbing people, I figured out too late that I was in a bad spot. Now luckily nothing happened, but there was a really scary moment where I got pinned up against a wall by a really mad riot cop in body armor who only decided not to beat me because he got distracted by a protesting Buddhist monk at the last second and he left me to attack him instead. There was a ton of tear gas in the air and I was choking pretty badly, but I snapped a quick photo from the hip of what was happening, and even though I was never able to publish it, afterwards it was a great reminder of just how real things could get. After that, I was super careful to pay attention to where the point of highest tension was, and then make sure that there was always a path to safety out of that zone, which is the first tip I want to give here. If you're going to get close to the action, always know how you're going to get out. If you find yourself in a similar situation, because after all, protests are exactly the kind of thing doc filmmakers cover often, keep your head up enough to know where your exit routes are and don't get yourself trapped like I did. Now, eventually the tension between the government and the protesters hit a boiling point. And one morning, the military decided to open fire on a group of protesters. It's not like they were shooting at me specifically, they just went full auto down a busy street and they ended up killing more than 10 civilians that morning. Luckily, I'd learned from my past mistakes at least a little bit, and this time I was smart enough to stay out of the, the anvil zone between the two opposing forces, but I was still down range of a unit of paratroopers firing AK-47s into a crowd, and I could hear bullets pinging off the ground and the buildings all around me, and wounded people were just being constantly evacuated down the street on motorbikes. I'd started the day with a few colleagues, but in the chaos we all got separated, and I was so preoccupied with what I was doing, I didn't look at my phone for hours. When I finally did pull it out, I found a ton 
ton of messages from my colleagues who were pretty freaked out that they hadn't heard from me. When I eventually found them, it's not like they were mad exactly, but they reminded me how stupid it had been to go off alone in the first place, but also how risky it was not to keep in contact in a situation like that when it was so dangerous. If I'd somehow gotten injured and no one knew how to reach me or where to find me, things could have been really bad. I've never forgotten that. And the lesson here is that if you're working in a tough place, you absolutely need to establish a communications protocol so that others know where you are and that you're safe. For sure, you need to do this with the people who are physically with you, like your fellow crew members. But beyond that, you also need to tell people outside the hotspot to know where you are, when you're supposed to be back, and at what point they need to be worried. That could be a producer back home, or your partner, or just a reliable friend, but someone needs to know what's up and what to do if you don't get in contact. Nowadays, there's a ton of easy ways to do that using just your phone, but more and more that also brings up the issues of digital security. We don't need to go too deep into tech conspiracies here, but depending on where in the world you're working, like, if you were trying to film in, say, Gaza or Ukraine right now, I'd say there's a real chance that you're at risk of being digitally compromised as well as physically hurt. So if you're nervous about this kind of thing, which you should be more and more these days, there's a few tools that are worth having to protect yourself. The first is an encrypted messaging app like Signal or Telegram. I'm not super current on all this stuff and which apps are really safe is always changing. I mean, WhatsApp used to be the secure one, but as of now, Signal does seem like a safe bet. I'm not saying you need to be paranoid all the time, but when you're shooting in a risky spot, it's worth changing over to something a bit more secure for the duration of the shoot. We recently switched all crew comms to signal during a shoot along the US-Mexico border and I think it just makes sense when you're in the field because with all the new surveillance tech out there, you never really know who might be trying to listen in. There's no real reason not to and you can just go back to iMessage or WhatsApp or whatever when the shoot wraps. So. Just do it. The other tool I think every filmmaker who travels should have is a VPN. You probably all know what these are. They mask your IP address so that you're harder to track online. And if you're constantly signing on to Wi-Fi from hotels or coffee shops or other random places, I don't think you should see these as optional anymore. Even just booking the flights to get where you wanna go, it's sometimes amazing how much money you can save just by using a VPN to hide your home country. There's lots of options out there when it comes to VPNs. I personally use Surfshark, who's kindly sponsoring this video. And a big part of that is because in a certain Service like this, I want something that's been around for a while instead of just some brand new startup with a weird name. Time in business means their apps and web extensions all work really well by this point, but maybe more importantly to most people, it's really affordable. Like depending on when you get it and what sort of deals they're on, it's as little as just a few dollars a month. So unlike most things filmmakers buy, it's not gonna break the bank. There's all sorts of other reasons that VPNs are handy outside of filmmaking. Like if me as a Canadian wanna access the US Netflix options, which are way better than what we have here for example, but let's stay focused on safety here. Because the real risk when you're out there filming isn't that you can't watch The Office enough, it's that you log onto your bank account from hotel Wi-Fi and someone gets all your details, or in a really bad scenario, it could actually lead to people pinpointing your location and then targeting you. Like if you wanted to go cover Ukraine or the Middle East right now, I think you'd be a little bit silly not to take this kind of threat seriously. Anyways, you, you get it all by now, it's just an easy and cheap way to protect yourself. And when I told the people at Surfshark I was making this video, they kindly agreed to sponsor it and give out three extra free months of service for anyone who signs up using the link in the description. So a big shout out to Surfshark because I'd be using it either way, so the bonus months are really just icing on the cake. But getting back to being shot at, after all those experiences in Cambodia, I'd say I was a little more aware of my security before, but at the same time, I sort of felt like my status as a journalist would protect me somewhat. Then something happened to change that perception forever, and I knew I had to get some real training under my belt. I don't wanna go too deep into this, but the short version is that in 2014, a journalist and filmmaker that I really respected named James Foley was kidnapped and eventually beheaded by ISIS while working in Syria, and the whole thing was captured on on video and then broadcast to the world. It was really nasty. Now, I didn't know James personally, but I was friends with some of his friends and we ran in really similar circles. So it actually hit me really close to home for someone like me who was drawn to stories about conflict. I knew I needed training, but like, what are you supposed to do if you want to get some skills under your belt? That's 
what I tried to figure out anyways. The answer for a lot of us might be hostile environment training, which if you've never heard of it before is sometimes called HEFAT training for hostile environment and first aid training. And they're courses for people who plan on going to dangerous areas that teach basic trauma and first aid and safety skills that are relevant to war zones. They also run through a lot of different scenarios, including kidnapping situations, uh, simulations, how to deal with roadblocks in sketchy areas, mobs slash riot scenarios, and a bunch of other stuff. There's lots of paid options, but it can be really pricey if you don't have a company or outlet paying for you, but you don't have to spend tons of cash either because I got mine through a scholarship. Mine was run by the Stephen Sotlaw Foundation. I'm not sure if they're still operating, but there are a lot of other free options out there for filmmakers if you look around. RISC or RISC or Reporters Instructed in Saving Colleagues is a free option that was formed after the legendary photographer Tim Hetherington was killed by a mortar fragment in Libya. So don't let money be the reason you don't at least look for this kind of training. I didn't pay a dime for mine and it wasn't something I ever thought I'd actually use use in real life until one day I found myself treating a colleague's gunshot wound in his leg in a parking lot in Juarez, Mexico. Now that's a long story and I've told parts of it before on the channel, but I was really happy to have those basic skills that I did. And if it hadn't been for the training, I don't think I would have had any idea how to deal with an injury like that or be able to stay calm enough to come up with an escape plan. And if a full HEFAT course seems like it's a lot more than you need at the moment, I totally get that. So instead just focus on trauma first aid so you at least have some idea what to do in the event of a car accident or some crazy black swan event. I hope you never need to use it, but if you do, you'll be so relieved to be able to actually do something instead of just standing to the side helplessly. This isn't about turning yourself into some sort of superhero combat medic, because that's not gonna happen, but studies have shown that people who are actively able to help in the aftermath of a traumatic event come out with substantially less PTSD than people who perceive themselves purely as victims. Learn how to apply a tourniquet to stop arterial bleeds, how to treat deep cuts, how to treat gunshots and broken bones, and how to check and clear airways and some basic CPR and you're gonna feel a lot more empowered, not to mention that you might actually be able to save someone's life. Tim Hetherington, that famous photographer I mentioned before, he wouldn't have died if someone nearby had a tourniquet on them and knew how to use it, so don't sleep on first aid. By the time you need it, it's already too late to learn. So before I dive into a couple more tools and tricks everyone can use, I'll just say one more thing for anyone wanting to work in a dangerous location. Have you ever seen that Guy Ritchie movie, The Covenant? It's not an amazing movie, and even if you plan to never watch it, which I don't blame you for, there's a scene where Jake Gyllenhaal's unit is about to drive down a road and into an ambush, and one of their local guys tells them it's not safe. They argue about it for a while, but eventually Jake decides to listen to the guide, and the advice stops them from driving into an ambush and probably all dying. Well, a filmmaker wandering into a place that they're not from, especially a dangerous place is no different than those bunch of soldiers driving straight into an ambush. When you're somewhere unfamiliar, you probably don't know how to read the subtle clues that local guides can recognize that indicate when a situation might go bad, and this is especially true in dangerous places where you don't know the local customs. That's why a good fixer is crucial, and I think if you're thinking of doing work in tough places, then a fixer should be one of the very first hires on any crew. A fixer is just another word for a local producer, and it's their job to arrange access, make connections, and also read the mood of a place to let you know when it might be a good time to go. The second time I got shot at, I was eating tacos in a tiny restaurant in Sinaloa, Mexico, when a bunch of gunfire just randomly hit the restaurant and sent everyone scattering. We hid behind a concrete post and when the shooting stopped, I had no idea what to do next. Like who was shooting at who? Were they coming back? Was it safe to stay there? Or should we just run out to the car and speed away? If you've never been in a moment like that, it's hard to describe how confusing it can be. But because I was with a really great fixer, he instantly knew what had happened, what we should do next, and who'd likely been involved. As it turned out from him, the safest thing to do was just stay in the restaurant and weirdly keep eating our tacos. But if I'd been by myself, I might have easily panicked and run straight out into the danger. I'll leave it there, but if you're gonna work somewhere dangerous, just hire a fixer, it should be non-optional in your budget. Now sometimes even when you have a fixer with you, it's still possible to do really stupid things and get yourself in trouble, like the time I was detained by military police in Vietnam and brought in for questioning. Long story short here, but I was in the Mekong Delta working with a photographer and a fixer, and we decided to fly a drone on an island that none of us had ever been to. We didn't really think that much about it, but when we got back to our hotel, there was a truck full of armed soldiers waiting for us, and they immediately escorted us to their base where we were basically interrogated by 
by a bunch of officers and threatened to the point where our fixer was in tears and thought she was going to go to jail. What had happened is without realizing it, we'd buzzed an unmarked military base with our drone. And this was an old Inspire 1 drone back in the day when drones weren't all that common yet. So to those guys, it must have looked like military tech from the future. It was a total accident and this was before restricted airspace was built into DJI apps. And the base didn't show up on Google Maps to our credit either. So we were almost as surprised as the soldiers. But luckily after a few hours, the interrogators were satisfied we weren't spies and they let us go. Well, first the base commander actually made us use the drone to take high altitude photos of him with his favorite car. But by that time, the tension was over. But ultimately we were in that situation because we didn't follow one of the most important rules when it comes to staying out of trouble. And that's to keep a low profile. We did the exact opposite, just announcing our presence on the island about as loudly as possible. And it almost got arrested and deported. You want to attract as little notice to yourself as you possibly can while still doing your job. And that's going to go a long way to mitigating risks. That might mean keeping your gear in the car until you understand the dynamics of where you're shooting or maybe paring down the kit a little, but you should always try and be aware of your surroundings and do what you can to be low key so you don't become the center of the story. But what do you do when things do get out of control despite your best efforts? Like how are you supposed to not panic and burst into tears like our fixer in that army base? Well, the answer is dead simple and it's one of the most powerful tools you have at your disposal that you've been using your whole life your breath. If you do this work long enough, it's inevitable that you're eventually going to get yourself into some sort of weird situation. And while it might not involve the military or getting shot at, that doesn't mean you won't be on edge. But it's so important that when things do go wrong, you don't freak out. And the best way you can do that is to breathe. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to go off on some weird Wim Hof tangent here. And I'm sure you've all heard of breath work before, but just trust me, it's not only for yogis or eccentric cold plunge gurus. Basically, if you can control your breathing, you can control your panic and you can physically calm down down very effectively just by breathing. I was actually taught emergency breathing by some ex special forces guys, and they like to call it tactical breathing. So by no means is this just woo woo hippie stuff, but whether you want to call it tactical breathing or mindful breathing or anything else for that matter, it's easy to learn and very powerful. The simplest form is just made up of four count breaths. So breathe in slowly for four seconds, hold it for four seconds, breathe out for four seconds and let your lungs stay empty for four seconds before starting again. So if we did it together, it might look like this. Breathe, two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four. Breathe out, two, three, four. Empty, two, three, four. And start again. If you do this even four or five times in a row, it's incredible how much you can change your physiological response to stress to the point where you can slow down your heart rate substantially, which makes you calmer. Calm people make better decisions. They see solutions where panic people don't, and they're able to de-escalate situations instead of amping things up, which is always the right move in a crisis. And a crisis doesn't have to mean being caught in a gun battle. This stuff also works for those moments when you realize a memory card has been corrupted or a lav mic failed during an important interview moment. Just just breathe through it and you'll put yourself in a much better position to fix it instead of just falling apart. So there we go. Some tips and tricks I've learned over the years that have helped me work in hotspots all over the world while staying safe. Now look, at the end of the day, I put myself in those situations willingly. And the only way to stay 100% safe is just to stay home. But I don't think any of us got into doc filmmaking to stay home. So get out there and shoot. Don't shy away from the tough stories, but just make sure you're doing everything you can to stay safe at the same time. See ya.